Hello everyone, I'm Lou Holder, Emmy Award-winning broadcast journalist and communications professor at Prince George's Community College. I'm coming to you from the Center for Performing Arts on the Largo campus to introduce a fascinating interview with NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander. Now, never in the history of journalism has politics and the American presidency been such hot-button topics. And Peter Alexander, well, he's had a front-row seat to some pretty significant news coming out of the most important residential address in our country. Now, with some help from some of the diverse student body population here at Prince George's Community College, please enjoy this Real Talk conversation with one of the most visible faces in the television news industry. Peter Alexander, welcome to the Holder Hangout. <laughs> Thanks for including me. I appreciate it, Lou. This is great. This is. It's great to have you on. As you know, I'm a big fan of your work. A lot of people are, and I actually am very interested um, in thoughts about your job currently. So I said at the open that no other time in journalism history has politics or the executive branch of the United States of America been hot button topics. I mean, Peter, honestly, every time I look at you on the news, I'm like, NBC News should give you some type of hazard pay uh, for the stuff that you have to deal with every day. I mean, it's, it's been tough for you the last couple of years, hasn't it? Yeah, no, the last couple of years, I think we're trying for anybody who does this, obviously, if you get into the journalism, you recognize it's not about you, right? Being a journalist by its nature is telling the story of other people. Right. So when it's turned on you in some way, I think that poses unique challenges. Everybody witnessed some of the clashes that um, President Trump and I had in the briefing room on occasion. But again, it was never about me. It was about trying to solicit answers from him. And and, and at the end of the day, I hope that's, that's what I accomplished. Being a journalist, as you know, Lou, is not about being popular, right? There are plenty of people that are gonna like you or dislike you. Your job is just to do your job and, and the cards will fall as they may. Now that's that's a great great insight and great way to get started. So I want to do a little macro first before I get into the micro of your current position. But I, I always want to ask people that I have come on how they get to where they were, where they are now. Um, honestly, we're all journalists. Uh, but we all have different paths on how we came to journalists. Some people went to school and said, man, I want to do this since I was five years old. And other people took a little uh, zigzag uh, approach. Peter Alexander, how did you get into journalism and how did you you know, quickly get to where you are as far as your, your journey? Well, I wish it were quickly, but it definitely started early. But I think if you ask my folks, they'd pull out some pictures from family albums of me with like a Fisher Price wrench upside down, trying to like broadcast a, a backyard basketball game with like some friends around the holidays or something like that. I've been sort of interested in, in TV broadcasting for a long time. Initially, I was interested in sports. That's what sort of I always dreamed of being like Bob Costas or something <laughs> like that. That was a little bit more challenging. So I took a different route and just put my head down. Um, so from early on, I wanted to do this. I started as a high school kid interning at the local station in Oakland, California, where I grew up. Um, I reached out, this is gonna be a lesson I hope we take away from this conversation, reached out to the local sports guy and basically did an article for my for my school on all the different sportscasters and sports writers. And some of them brought me in and one was particularly nice, this guy. And after the interview was done and our conversation, I wrote him a few months later and said, hey, you mind if I come down again? And he said, sure. And then I wrote him three months later and said, hey, can I come down again? And eventually before I could drive, my parents were dropping me off once a week at a local news station as just a 16 year old kid, a 15 year old kid uh, in Oakland, California. So I was kind of mesmerized by the energy of a newsroom. Yeah. I went to school in Chicago at Northwestern. Everybody's path is unique, but I was sort of committed to this craft and I studied journalism. Mm -hmm. And then I bounced around from faraway places from Lexington, Kentucky, where a job existed to Spokane, Washington, to Seattle, Washington, three cities I had never been in in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate and blessed that when I was in Seattle, uh, NBC saw some of my work and reached out and, and brought me back to, to introduce itself and ultimately the the rest is uh, not history, but is is where we are today. Wow, and, that, and that's that's interesting. You know, I'm gonna tell my broadcasting students that uh, some people go right to uh, a top market, but other people have to make those stops in between. That's one of those um, labors of love. If you love it, you'll go do broadcasting anywhere. You go. Yeah, and as I would, and as, as I would say to those who are listening to our conversation, Lou, like there was real, like nowadays the way things have changed and digitization and 
and these other different outlets, like there are a lot of different ways to do it. For me, what was so unique or not unique, what was so, I, I think, beneficial of this experience was that it, I was able to make my mistakes where there weren't as many people watched them, so to speak, right? Like, it, and there's value in it. It stunk. I was living nowhere. Like literally I made, when I started my job, my first job, I made 22 or $24,000 a year, right? You weren't making a lot of money um, in these stations in faraway places. Um, but I learned a lot about life. I learned, you know, how to look after myself. I had to figure out how to get my way to work. I had to find a way to buy a car. I had to find a way to tell a story. I had to find a way to be live on TV and screw up. And I have plenty of those to share with you. But eventually all those experiences helped me get better as not just a person, but as a professional. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. So that's the macro, how you got there. Uh, and now the micro. So, um, you know, I'm schooling people. Some people know the terms and the lingo, others do not. So anybody watching this, I'm trying to kind of be all, all purpose, all encompassing for everybody. Uh, so you're a correspondent, but there's differences between being a correspondent, an analyst, and a reporter. You know, some right. people are like, how come Peter's not giving more of his opinion? No, we're not paid to give opinions as reporters and correspondents. That is for analysts and people that get paid to do that. Our job is to tell the story. So could you tell us kind of the differences that you have run across with a correspondent versus a reporter versus those, versus those analyst roles? Well, definitely between like the reporter correspondent sort of track and the analysis commentary track. For me, the design is always to be a journalist, which is about telling the story and trying to find the facts, right? As I describe it to people, I'm not an advocate for Republicans. I'm not an advocate for Democrats. I'm an advocate for the facts, mm -hmm. right? So my job, no matter who it is, whether it's Kaylee McEnany or Sean Spicer or Sarah Sanders under President Trump or Jen Psaki or whoever else is in the briefing room uh, these days under President Biden, my job is to try to push them to get as close to the facts as I can to dig down to get a better understanding of how they got to this place. It doesn't mean I can't provide context, which to some degree is some, uh, you know, analysis, but it's not commentary. I'm not going to say, hey, you know what, I think they really screwed this thing up, or I think they really should have done this. That's for other people to judge. People are going to get that chance. My job is to set the table for them to be able to make those conclusions. As I say, when I meet Americans, I want them to decide for themselves how they feel about the facts. And if I've succeeded, I put them in the best position to have all the information that I can provide to be able to make those decisions. Wow, that's great. I love the way you said set the table, because as a sportscaster, <clears throat> that's what I've always done too. I don't the wins and losses and everything, it's just more of how the story and letting people decide, did they screw that up? Did they have done better? So it's all a, about telling the story. So, uh, Peter, I, I'm telling you, this is the United States of America, but there's nothing really united about these states right now. There is so much good and so much, I mean, there's so much drama going on. And a lot of them, a lot of it has to deal embedded with politics and the political climate that we're we're in right now on one hand there is so much joy that um politics and people in lawmaking roles look more like the united states of america with women yeah. and people of color and things of that nature uh, but then you have some political corruptness and bipartisanism uh some stuff that goes on and you're in the middle of all of it you're getting this this front row seat to the good and the bad of politics and journalism and things of that nature. Uh, could you just expound on w what it's been like for you to see the good and the bad happen right in front of you at this time in history? Well, anybody who's in this conversation who lives in this area has witnessed a lot more history in the last six months in our own backyard that I think you ever imagined, right? From the second impeachment trial, one of very, a handful in history, mm -hmm. to an insurrection, to an inauguration, to all of this that we've seen, right? This is not like this is stuff you read in history books and we're living it as we speak right now. So I think one of the best pieces of the pieces of advice I got, this is from Tom Brokaw, who was a mentor to me when I first got to NBC, when I was asked him, Hey, how do you handle this or handle that? Particularly during the Trump administration. He said, he said, Peter, there, there's no, there's no like guide to this. This is all new territory that we're in right now. So you got to trust your instincts and trust your gut and do the best job that you can every given day. So that's to say that I do not claim in any form to be an 
an expert on this, even on journalism. I'm still learning as I go and trying to watch the way that my colleagues at other shops across the street and at NBC do their job so I can be better. But in terms of what I have seen, one of the important takeaways for this, for our conversation is that you're going to hear a lot of talking points, right? You're going to hear these guys say this and these guys say that. And your job as a journalist is to be able to sort of synthesize those things, digest them, and then contextualize them, right? So if you hear someone say, I don't know, let's just say, oh, hey, I can't believe these dental Republicans lately have been saying about President Biden. No, he's spending way too much money. Can you believe how much money he's spending? This is awful. You got to remind the audience how much money Republicans spent under Donald Trump with their own COVID relief bills and some of their own plans and how much the debt and deficit grew in the past administration, right? So you have to like sort of give it a broader perspective. Same thing for Democrats. Like just a couple of days ago, Joe Biden was announcing um, early on, he, he said that they weren't going to let any more refugees into this country than President Trump had set a historically low cap of 15,000 a year. Well, only a matter of months ago, President Biden's own advisors, one of his, his secretary of state, I think said, we're letting in 62,500 this year. So my job is to say, hey, you, you guys said it was gonna be 62,500 this year. Now you're saying it's 15,000. What changed, what's different? And it would turn out on that day and we start asking those tough, tough questions. They started hearing it from others as well. They said, all right, you know what? Okay, uh, so we'll let in some more people. We'll let in some more people. And that's doing your job. It's pressing them, putting your foot on the gas and forcing the administration, forcing anybody. It doesn't have to be politics to answer uh, some of these tough questions. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I tell all my students that uh, politics, entertainment, and sports are all interwoven in the journalism craft. I mean, if you if you don't believe me, you know, uh, I told them just to look at what happened in Georgia with that all-star game yeah. and how politics got that all-star game in sports moved, yeah. right? And so everywhere it's all intertwined and you know, when you see the journalism story thread throughout all of it, do you see the commonalities you talked about starting in sports and now you're in politics, uh, your beat, your specific beat, you know, the specific nuance of what you cover. Do you see the journalism traits, like you said, trustworthiness, accuracy, uh, being fair um, to both sides? Do you see all that interwoven in all that you do? I think for sure. I mean, Number one, if you're going to do this, be committed to doing something like this, and I hope to anything, but particularly to journalism, where you really have a higher responsibility, a higher obligation to the audience that you're serving in your community. You are in some form a public servant. You're a provider of information. You got to focus on integrity and you got to focus on honesty, right? Because that's all you've got in this business. Yeah. You're someone that people believe when they're speaking. And so that's like fundamental to what I try to do in all of this. In terms of the connection between sports and politics and news of all kinds, like these days, it seems like everything is interconnected, right? But the truth is for what we do at the end of the day, it's all about telling the story and, and beyond that it's all about the people whose story you're telling whether it's a celebrity or a regular person that you meet on the street one day a business person or a politician everybody has a story that adds to the conversation for i'll give you i'll pull back the curtain a little bit um joe biden's going to celebrate 100 days in office next week i think it's wednesday or thursday uh for nightly news nbc nightly news with lester holt i'm going to go off to georgia and the next couple of days. Don't tell my competition if they're watching this conversation. And we're going to talk to some voters. We're going to talk to folks in the state that was crucial, not just swinging the Senate to the Democrats when they won two seats by Democrats, John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, but also earned Joe Biden and the Democrats a victory in a, what had been a red state for many years. And we want to talk to real people to see how real policy is affecting real people and to get their views on it. And I think that's at the end of the day, the way that you can succeed in doing this is remember when you're reporting and when you're anchoring that you're talking to people. You're not just saying, hello, everybody. You're not, when you're talking to hello, everybody, that's like you're talking to a stadium. I'm talking to Lou Holder, who's at home on his couch, and imagine you on the couch when I'm telling you the news. Hey, so by the way, today in news, da 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 da. And that's what I try to visualize when I'm communicating in an effort to better resonate in terms of my words with the audience with whom I'm interacting. Mm -hmm. All right, some 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 maybe some myths tied in, or maybe some cool things that people don't know. Um, everybody thinks that the press room in the White House is just some big sprawling area. Yeah. Could you tell them how big that area actually is? When people see the press room in Jen Psaki and then they cut away to you, whatever, um, they'll be surprised to know that it's not as big as you think. 
Yeah, it's hardly as glamorous as we like to claim on television. And it's felt a lot tighter in COVID, as you can imagine, right? We used to sit on top of each other. Now we've spread out, so there's a much smaller number of folks in that room. So I think there's probably, I don't even know off the top of my head, I think there's like 40 or something, maybe 50 seats in there. Right now we're probably sitting 20 of us at best in that room, probably less as I think about it. And when I go to work at the White House, it's pretty cool. I get to say I go to work at the White House. I'm proud of that. That was a, that was a, a, a goal for a long time for me. But the, the office that I work in is at the White House, but it's basically the size of like a, a bathroom without the shower, right? And I share it minus COVID, before COVID, with like four other people. We just squeeze in there and you're just bumping elbows. You know, now we spread out. So there's only two of us allowed at a time. But those are my, those are my tight quarters. And I would get to work before the Today Show at roughly six in the morning and stay there till roughly seven at night unless there's news that keeps me later in the evening. So I'm working a 13 hour day on average. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're not there, you're constantly looking at your phone. Even as I speak to you, I'm, I'm feeling the vibration from people at, at the office trying to reach me, surely trying to get some help on something they're reporting out right now. Mm -hmm. So they are tight quarters at the White House. The unique thing about it is there's only so many people who get that golden ticket, as it were, to get to work there. So for that, I'm very grateful. And it gives you the ability to walk into parts of the West Wing. You can't just walk to the Oval Office and say, hey, Joe, you want to chat? But you can walk up to Jen Psaki's office or some of the communications expert, communications director's offices and have conversations with them to get a better understanding of policies and a better preview of what might be coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. And then the other location that most people probably see you in is that perch uh, in front of the White House where I think people probably don't know that it's like stacked up where you have all these networks just doing broadcasting at the same time and you'll be looking down a row and you'll see all kind of broadcasters uh, yeah. doing their thing. Is it kind of cool? Does it get old that when you do something like that where you are or... Well, I would I would like to tell you that I'm looking down, seeing just to, just to check it out. Usually, I'm just listening. I'm just like, do they know something? I don't know. And if they do, what are they saying? Can y'all get a look? You know, cup your ear a little bit. Um, one of the coolest things is you go to a news conference pre-COVID, right? And you'd see all the correspondents. You watch CNN or MSNBC. I'll be on NBC for a special report or MSNBC, and you'll see us like side by side, smushed, and we're all talking to our cameras like this. So we eight people side by side by side by side, all talking at the exact same time. I think that's the hardest thing we do because you try to keep your train of thought on deep policy issues with the most powerful person on the planet about to walk in the room behind you or perhaps already there. And all of his advisors, including maybe the Secretary of State and Chief of Staff seated right behind you, that's what I call a stressful situation. But in terms of being on the North Lawn, that's always very cool. And so for me, when I got the opportunity to become an NBC White House correspondent, the night that then anchor Brian Williams of Nightly News was going to announce me. They said, hey, we need you We need you on the North Lawn, as we call it. Pebble Beach is its nickname. We need you to hustle down there and get to it. Again, I'm from Oakland, California. I'd been to Washington, D.C. once in my entire life. I'd seen the White House once in my entire life in person before the night that they announced that I was the White House correspondent for NBC News. And literally, I had to say to one of my bosses, I said, I don't know how to get there. I'm going to need a ride. So they drove me to the White House because I couldn't even find my way down there on that first night. And I was shaking as I walked in there, like angelic music was playing. <laughs> and I walked to my position. The live shot, I won't encourage anybody to go find it. It wasn't pretty. I don't even know if it was English, but at least it's over. <laughs> so um, another thing is that uh, a, a myth would be that, um, and you mentioned it kind of uh, briefly earlier, is that we don't get along with our competitors. Um, and when you're doing this and you're on a beat for so long, you do form friendships. Um, there's one clip that I play every semester to my classes. It was an exchange with uh, Jim Acosta from CNN and President Trump. Um, and then they came to you and you said, I, I must say that um, Jim's a very good reporter um, and I vouch for everything that he, you know, and then President Trump obviously said, well, I'm not a big fan of yours either. So it was, it was more like a brothers in arms type of thing. So you would think that we don't get along in competition, but at the end of the day, we're all telling the same story and we, you, you do spend more time 
with those people on the beat than you do with your family members and you and you do become close. Absolutely. From local news days, those were the reporters that I competed against for the ones I saw out at every crime scene, at every city hall meeting, at every sporting championship or whatever event it would be. You saw them all the time and you built a relationship, friendship, sometimes a competition. In the early days, it was a lot of competition because we were all trying to get seen and, and to rise in the ranks, so to speak. And now, you know, it's the same thing. That Jim Acosta moment that you talk about, people may remember this news conference. The president att attacked Jim and said, you know, that he, whatever. He was he was all upset at Jim. And I was next. And I was just waiting for my turn. I was like, oh, boy, what do you do? And, I, I, and again, as we start this conversation, it's not about me. So the last thing I wanted to do was make this about me or about Jim. And what I said in that moment was effectively, hey, you know, Jim, like everybody else in this room, I remember saying, like everybody else in this room, we're just, I think I said, busting our butt trying to do the best job that we can. Um, and then he said, I'm not a fan of yours either. And in that moment, what I'm proud of, and I hope resonates for folks, is that I didn't say, oh, really? Well, I think you're a, I just said, thank you. My question is, yeah. right? Like, you can say whatever you want about me. I don't care. That doesn't do, it doesn't help me. It reflects on you. My question is the following, and I'd like to hear an answer to it. And I went right to my question on that topic, which the answer people can judge for themselves, whether it was satisfactory. But my job in there is not to focus on myself or to focus on my colleagues. It's really to focus on on the person I'm covering, but to, but to what you speak about, about the relationship between reporters, that's what I think makes this career path so, so joyful in many ways. You just have like the intersections with so many people in life, the photographers I've met all over the planet, the people that I was in Baghdad with and Afghanistan with, you know, and in Israel with Dodge and Katusha rockets with, the people I slept, you know, through earthquakes with during after the tsunami in Bandache, Indonesia, those are relationships and bonds um, that you can't break because it, it's a unique group that, that commits itself to this, to this craft. Mm -hmm. So your president and uh, leader of the free world would be my Tiger Woods or my um, just Serena Williams, people that you covered um, that were memorable. Is there a person uh, it doesn't have to be the executive, the, the commander in chief. It could be a four star general. It could be whatever. Is there a person that you met during your career that you were just like, you know what? That was really, really cool. <laughs> that, I mean, I, I, there's my job, and then there's the <laughs> that's really, really cool. Uh, I mean, let's be clear like, they're all really cool. I mean, when Barack Obama walked in the room yeah. the first time and I was supposed to, and he called my name to ask a question, like, I, you know, you're shaking, you're nervous. He was <laughs> the president of the United States is the first president I ever covered. So none of this suggests that I don't think this is cool and exciting. Like, I'm exhilarated by a lot of it. It's not always exciting. There are a lot of tough days, a lot of long days. You're not seeing the president every day of the week. That's still a rare and unique experience. The one, the one memory that to me probably stands out above all else was when I was very new at NBC. This was in 2004. Um, they sent me off to a hurricane. Uh, it was then a Cat 5 barreling toward Havana, Cuba. And we went down there and, you know, very few people get to go to Cuba. I was about to cover a storm that they had that they believed was just going to ruin the infrastructure of an island that was already decimated by dis, you know, disrepair and, and corruption and whatever else. And we were there, and, and I said to the producer, I said, well, so, I mean, what do we do? I don't even speak Spanish. And she said, well, I think we should, uh, you know, what, what if we reach out to Castro? I said, yeah, we should reach out to Castro. So we wrote a letter to Fidel Castro, and we said, hey, to his communications person, and we said, hey, you could do an interview where all the reporters from all the American networks and cable channels are here. You could do an interview with any one of them, and it would be a, a very exciting. But if you do an interview with our reporter, it would make his it would make his career and about an hour or two hours later they reached out to a patient's person for fidel castro and said the president has agreed to the interview request meet him in canar del rio the western province where the tobacco country is where they make the famous cigar tobacco we drove three hours into the eye of a hurricane met him in an abandoned schoolhouse interviewed fidel castro the conversation was in spanish via translation I was so like a Forrest Gump moment, like he was in black and white and I was in color that for most of the interview, which is shot in a two shot, you better show your reporters with the Fidel Castro. Right. And I was like this the whole time. I was like, and then realizing I had no idea what he was saying. And he could be saying, I'm going to harm all Americans beginning with you. There was a very awkward moment in the conversation where I go, hmm, mm hmm. 
<laughs> It'll it. Anyway, as cool experiences go, that one that I still saved the picture that someone captured from that day is is definitively a highlight I won't forget. No. How about uh, traveling on Air Force One? I know that there's this great picture of you uh, when you recently had to travel on Air Force One. That's one place not many people get to go. They do get to go through the White House and see certain things. Uh, Air Force One, uh, no. Nah. That is a rarefied air, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, and that's something that you've been able to share. How 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 is it in there? Is it a mobile office of yeah. uh, of epic proportion? I would like to tell you that I get to go see most of it, but they put us way in the back in the little in the little reporter area. But it's still Air Force One, and you still know that you're traveling with the President of the United States. As you remember on 9/11, when then President Bush had to fly from place to place as he was they were unaware of what this threat might be. The, the crew, they call it the pool of reporters that travel with the president everywhere, not always on Air Force One. Sometimes when he goes and plays golf in Wilmington, Delaware, as he did this past weekend, and they sit at a little restaurant across the street. The pool is there in case the president they need access to the president in some form, or the president needs access to the media. Air Force One is very cool. The old, when I when I flew on it in Obama's administration, all the seat belts had like the presidential seal mm. in it, which was very cool. And they have a little name card that says your name with a seal on it and a ham. The last trip, they served as hamburgers, and it had like a little placemat that had the seal on it. This, I mean, I thought it was cool. I was texting like every relative I had. I was like, "What's up? How you doing? Check this out. Look what I mean." So that's a very cool experience. And um, and truthfully, as a as a television reporter, you get those opportunities very rarely because most times I have to be where the president's going to say, and you can see Air Force One has landed. Rarely do you get to travel with him. But we've been going out, uh, out of our way to try to make more opportunities to do that because sometimes the president, usually before COVID, hasn't happened as recently, the president might come back off the record, we call it, a conversation that you can't record, you can't report on, but just giving you a sense of his thoughts on things. Um, and, I'll, and so we'll say, hey, so what do you really think this immigration crisis is really a challenge? What are you going to do about that? And he'll say, yeah, you guys are right. This is really, you know, or whatever you might say. And that gives you a real insight into the way they're viewing these things and may help you do a better job of contextualizing your reporting coming up. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, Peter, we have a very diverse uh, student body population at Prince George's uh -huh. Community College. And what I've done is I've assembled some of the 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 best from my classes uh, to join you in a conversation to talk uh, young, old, American, foreign, um, just different perspectives on journalism and politics from their eyes. And um, I'm asked them to join us. And so when we come back, uh, they're all going to ask you some questions. Uh, I've gone through some of the questions. They're really, really good. And it will get it, it will kind of get the breadth and depth um, to our conversation, but through the eyes of um, students, through the eyes of students. So I uh, hope you're ready for that. So when we come back, Peter Alexander and the students of Prince George's Community College, stay with us. We'll be right back. Prince George's Community College celebrates the one thing that unites us all. Diversity. What does diversity mean for us? It means my life matters. My story is her story. It means we are more than what you think we are. It means that our contributions are important. It means I am proud to be who I am. It means don't talk about people, talk about ideas. Porque nosotros estamos unidos en esto. We're in this together. We are in this together. We're, We're in, in this together. together. We're in this together. Celebrating diversity at Prince George's Community College.
Welcome back to this Real Talk conversation with NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander, who's been dropping nuggets and knowledge that is unbelievable. What a rich conversation so far. We are now bringing in some of my communication students at Prince George's Community College, Peter, that have been very, very hyped and uh, excited to ask you questions because Overall, universally, everybody was like, Peter Alexander, I wonder what he does, um, you know, behind the scenes. So there's going to be some great dialogue, great questions from some young minds uh, and some energetic minds. So um, we are going to start with uh, Gabriella. Gabriella has a question for you, Mr. Alexander. Gabriella, could you make yourself known and then ask Mr. Peter Alexander your question? Hello, yes, my name is Gabriella, and I would just like to start off with, it's a pleasure talking to you today. And I would just like to start off this conversation with addressing the negative um, backlash that the media has been receiving these past couple of years. Um, some people, whether it be politicians or just regular citizens, have considered some large media corporations as fake news due to various factors, but one of them being is the implement of bias, whether it be from the media corporation itself or by the journalist. And I would just like to ask you, how do you make sure that the news stories you cover maintains objectivity without placing your personal bias? Gabriella, first of all, nice to meet you. That is an awesome and excellent and timely question. So I'm grateful for your asking it. So I will just acknowledge that I'm one person in a big system, right? But what I try to focus on is what I can control. And what I, what I try to control is that every time that I speak on camera, that I'm asking questions, that I am focusing on the facts and on the truth. And the truth of the matter is that I can't control a lot of the other things that are out there. I can't control when politicians attack, but I can't control that I get my information right. And I can't control that the audience, when they hear me speak, knows that what I'm saying is trustworthy and worth believing. When I go out there and talk about an experience, something I just saw or share a person's story, I can tell it in context so that they can have faith that the information I'm sharing really captures that person's point of view. One of the real challenges these days, obviously, is with the different conservative and liberal bents in prime time cable television, folks are giving you their view on things. I'm not in the my view of things game, right? I'm in the just, here's what the story is. Now, what I will acknowledge in journalism, that's one of the challenges is, I like to, I, I feel confident that whenever we're doing a story, we're gonna tell it fair. We're gonna give both sides, we're gonna give a perspective and context as best we can. But sometimes as a function of deciding that's a story you're gonna do, you draw attention to a certain thing, right? Sometimes by ignoring a certain population or not on purpose perhaps, but just not having enough diversity in your storytelling, you miss significant views. And so one of the real challenges that exists in our business right now and why this conversation is so important is that you want to make sure that all voices are heard so that all folks feel included from rural Georgia to, you know, to Washington, DC, from Washington state um, to, to the exurbs of Florida, right? To make sure that populations from all different parts of this country, not just demo, not just physically, geographically, but demographically have the, their perspective shared and told so that everybody feels like the news is speaking to them and not just speaking to a simple group. Now that said, in news these days, there are a lot of business decisions being made by people way upstairs above yeah. me about who in particular they're targeting, right? I try to stay out of those conversations. I just try to focus on what I do each day. And sometimes if I hear pushback on a story I'm doing, they'll never say, hey, this story needs to be biased. But they might say, hey, you're missing this voice. Or what if we did this? Those are the best conversations that exist in a newsroom because it gets you the closest you can to the actual story, to the actual experience that people are having right now. But there is, but I don't think anybody would claim that the news is a perfect system right now. And that's why you guys being involved and passionate about it is so important. That's great, Gabriella. Way to get us started. Way to get us started. Uh, Gary, 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 you're up next. Gary, you're up next. Your question for Mr. You, Mr. Alexander. Alexander. Hello, Gary. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. So as a Chief White House correspondent, can you tell us what it's like in a newsroom when an emergency situation occurs, such as an uh, insurrection of the U.S. Capitol? So, uh, so there's the human element to this which is like the tragedy of a lot of these things breaking news as it's described in our business there's also the professional element which is that adrenaline rush you get when news is breaking and you know that you've got to get to the bottom of it right away or it's evolving and you don't know what's going to happen 
next. I remember the day of the insurrection. I was at the White House as this day started. You remember the rally began just south of the White House um, near the ellipse. And in order to leave, they had me leave in the building. We were rotating out people to go. I was going to head out. We were shifting, we were switching shifts um, because of COVID. They didn't want many of us at the White House that day. And they had a security guard who literally escorted me to my car because we had to walk through a protest of people who were yelling fake news and whatever else throughout the course of it. So that was like real. That's when the news becomes real. And you recognize that as a journalist, you yourself in some ways are a target. I remember my first assignment in Baghdad where news would be breaking and you'd hear explosions. There was a day where I think it was the deadliest day in the city of Baghdad that they had in the course of that war, where there were 24 car bombs went off in Baghdad on a single day and we're staying in the building that we were in. And, you know, and that, you want to talk about adrenaline, that's real adrenaline and you were there. There's no like, there's no ripcord, there's no exit strategy, right? You, you have smart people around you. But in, in moments like that, you, you know, you, you go to your training and on that occasion, like when you wear your flak jacket to go out to a story to try to shoot it, we had, it used to say journalist in big letters across the front because that was like a, that was like made you safe, right? That doesn't make you safe anymore these days. We would take that off. We would hide that stuff. It would be nowhere to be found in case somebody got a hold of us and was trying to figure out exactly who we were. So just to, to answer your question, in, in truth, when emergencies, when breaking news happens, it's an adrenaline pump, but it forces you to focus on what you're trained to do, which is call sources, get the best information you can, and communicate to your colleagues and to the audience. Mm -hmm. Gary, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Gary, great question. Great question. Ameka, Ameka, you're up next. Ameka, question for Mr. Peter Alexander. Go. It's, it's nice having this conversation with you, Mr. Peter. Thanks, Ameka, you too. Yeah, um, I'm an African immigrant, and um, most Africans listen to a lot of Western media for the information, and then they, they rely most of the uh, most uh, uh, about the information that we get about Western, we, 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 Western media and the, and the cultures of America. But recently, most political events have uh, kind of biased all the kind of information we get from the media. So as a, a, a reputation, as a reputable uh, journalism of no, no notes, how do you strike a balance between the information that you get across and then considering that the whole world is watching? It's a great question. And, and now more than ever, the real challenges, right? And the words that we say as journalists matter, they affect people's decisions, they affect, they affect policy, and they affect people's understanding of, of the way the world works. So in terms of that balance, I guess the best way to say that is that like, I, I don't claim to be a perfect person. I'm an imperfect person, of course, and I, but I try to do the best job I can to gather information and to communicate to the audience how I got that information. If I'm on the air, I'll say, hey, in a conversation today, a senior advisor to the president of the United States told me the following, right? Now, people can judge for themselves whether they want to believe those folks, you know, but I'll say they told me the following. Now, remember, I'll say to the audience, only a couple of days ago, they had been saying this, and this is what changed. An example most recently was, you know, there's been a lot of pressure on Kamala Harris, the vice president, to go. Republicans have tried to make a um, have put, tried to put pressure on her for not going to the Northern Triangle nations or not going to the border, which is going to be an issue she's going to be in charge of. And I spoke to some of her aides and they said, hey, she is not in charge of the border. She's in charge of diplomacy with Guatemala, with Honduras, with El Salvador. When I was on Meet the Press with Chuck Todd, I talked about that. I said, I would watch. Republicans are really going to try to put a lot more intensifying pressure on Kamala Harris. What I'm told by the vice president's aides is, in spite of that pressure, they don't expect to be going to those to those nations for another two months, which Republicans will surely pounce on. But what the White House will tell you is the following, and I try to do my best to contextualize and give it and, and give people a better understanding of it. Now, in terms of a bias or not, I mean. The bias, I think people make their own judgments. You have to have faith that the audience knows. When you're asking a certain question and they hear an answer, you don't have to say, what the heck, that's crazy. Sometimes the audience gets it. I asked Donald Trump during the early days of COVID, I said to him after an exchange we had back and forth and it got heated, I said, what do you say? I think only a handful of Americans had died at this point. I said, what do you say to Americans out there, the camera's right behind me, what do you say to those Americans right now who are scared? This is in television terms of softball, right? This is not a tricky question, but it can also be elucidating. It can get an illuminating for the audience. And he said, I say you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say, which made for an interesting soundbite and quite a moment. 
I don't think it helped the audience at home. It didn't demonstrate compassion or a clarity of understanding about the seriousness of this moment. So my question may have been simple. Some Democrats may have said, what a softball, what an easy one. My job is just to ask those things and you can judge by the answer on some occasions what you make of it. I hope that answers you a little bit. I think it's a great question. Yeah, thank you, Mecca. Uh, Sean Vincent, Sean Vincent, you are up next, Sean Vincent. Your question to Mr. Peter Alexander, go. Uh, hello, Mr. Ex Alexander, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, and thank you, Professor Holder, for giving me this opportunity to clear up some things I had on my mind. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, uh, Mr. Alexander, uh, my question sort of has two parts. So the first part really is um, earlier, um, Mr. Hol uh, Professor Holder brought up partisanship. So my question is, how has that affected uh, or impacted politics in the way it's reported in your experience? It's a great question. I think one of the real challenges right now, right, and, and this is something that the Biden administration is trying to focus on, is that the media often just says, here's what Democrats say and Republicans say. And sometimes those lawmakers in Washington are best representing what their constituents say, right? Like, for example, the COVID relief bill, now law, um, not a single Republican supported it, which a lot of people say, oh, that's a sign of serious partisanship in the country, and only Democrats supported it, all Republicans disliked it, or a 50-50 Senate. But if you looked at the polls, and polls have their own issues, I'm not a pollster, but you guys all know that, that the majority of Americans did support this, did feel strongly that $1,400 checks for Americans of certain means was important, and all this other stuff that came along with it they thought was relevant and significant. So, so in terms of the partisanship, one of the challenges is, is that you don't just say, here's what Republicans say, here's what Democrats say, but you really get to the root of it to try to give people a better understanding, which is hard. When I do a story, and I don't get a lot of time to say it, so it's easy to pick a really colorful soundbite, and often, too often, that does happen. But for those who really are willing to like engage with the, with the news and watch a cable channel during the day and see the way a story builds and progresses, they sometimes get a better understanding of what's behind those positions. Sometimes they're saying that for their own domestic politics. They have to be critical of the president because in their own district, a lot of these Republicans, for example, beat them would be someone who's Biden. You're not gonna get a lot of Democrats to vote with you, but you need to have your base motivated to help support you. I hope my internet symbol signal is good. It said it was having trouble, but I'll keep going. Sean, the good question. Go again, though. Yeah. And, and Lou interrupt me if this is wrong. Part, the second part of your question. Go ahead, Sean. Second part, yeah. So um, do you believe that political journalism is uh, too often reduced to sound bites and talking heads? And if so, is there anything to combat this? Yeah, no, you're right. Obviously, I think as we spoke about a little bit earlier, there's a lot of sound bites and you just hear some of the same faces saying the same things over and over again, like they're upset for this, they're angry about this, and rarely do you create this pressure to help force people together to have a conversation, right? So my job is often in private, if not on camera, because sometimes what you hear in private is different from what you hear publicly from these lawmakers, is to try to get to the root of what they're thinking and what's driving their decision making. Right. But but you're I mean, you're right. Like I care about this country as much as everybody else who's a part of this conversation right now. And there's nothing that I like less than to see these conversations be just dissolved into these two opposing positions in which there's no connection, no ability to meet in the middle. And I think that's one of the problems fundamentally that exist in politics. I don't suggest to you that this is going to change overnight. This is sort of where we find ourselves right now and is evidenced by the last administration where Donald Trump sort of governed with one view. Joe Biden, you know, is trying to govern to a larger audience, but really focusing on democratic priorities. We live in two opposite, two opposing views of the world in parts of this country right now. And I think we're going to be on that pendulum for a little while. Great question, Sean. Great question. Thank you, Sean, a lot. <clears throat> uh, Rueda. Rueda. Hi, Mr. Are up next for Mr. Peter Alexander. Hi, Rueda. Hi, pleasure to be speaking with you. So mm -hmm. my question was, with social media being as big as ever, it's where a vast majority of Americans get their news and people all over the globe. What are your views on the regulation of social media and its effects on journalism? 
It's a good question. In terms of the regulation, those are decisions that the lawmakers are going to make. In terms of use of social media, I think what I would propose to you, a couple of things. One, for all you guys in this conversation, recognize that your words matter. You're students now, but when you're looking for jobs years from now, what you've written on social media, some of the, the way you've presented yourself, all that stuff matters. You're entitled to make mistakes mistakes in life, we all do, but just be considerate of that, especially as you look to become professionals in this or some other field, right? The, the system has changed. When I was growing up, thank goodness there wasn't social media. <laughs> you know, you'd be able to see anything that was going on. Now Amen. Hey, say that again for the people in the back. Amen. <laughs> exactly. Don't make, don't make me get started on Lou Holder. All right. We got stories. Um, but, but, but the truth is, so that's one thing. So that's in the way you conduct yourself on social media. The other thing, I do think that social media does have a unique opportunity if used well, right? If breaking news is happening, there is nothing more instant than social media. You can literally in real time, in real time as a person, we're all now what we sort of describe as content providers. We're way to, if you're out on the street when a protest is going on, or if you're at a political rally, wherever you might be, and you see stuff, what you tweet, that information is shared and gives people a glimpse in, into that moment. And so when I'm covering breaking news on occasion, I'll say, hey, just ask the president this, here was his answer. Or you guys have been waiting to see, um, you know, what it looks like inside this brand new ballpark that they're building. Here's our first shot, our first look, right? You have the ability to sort of give people access, bring them places that they can't get on their own. And that's when social media can be used at its best. The other thing it's done is it's broken down walls, which is to say it is a direct line to people, right? Like if I'm trying to get a hold of some of the old days, you know, you did the news and you kind of went back to your newsroom or your apartment. And nobody ever knew how to reach it. Now, if they're upset about something I said, I'm going to hear about it. Or if I'm trying to ask a politician a question, they're ignoring me. I'll say, hey, comms communications director for this politician. Here's the question. We sent it to your office. You didn't hear it. We look forward to your answer as we try to get a better understanding of this story and this position that you've taken. And so I think it in some ways has really elevated all of us to make us more powerful in the system when it's used right. Great question, Lorraine. Great question. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, Christy, 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 you are up next with Mr. Peter Alexander. Uh, go. Hi, Mr. Alexander. How are you? Hi, Christy. Thank you. Thanks for being with us and taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, speaking of busy schedules, um, how do you manage or balance your home and work life? <laughs> you want to you want to start this, do you? I was gonna. I'm looking at the door. It's locked. <laughs> so, so the truth is, um, there. I, I want to answer that in two ways. There's the experience of getting to this place where I am in my professional career, and there's the experience of being in this place. And in getting to this place, there were a ton of sacrifices, right, to your personal life to have this professional the professional opportunities. I worked all the Christmases and all the Thanksgivings and the New Year's and gave up a ton. I missed holidays with my family. I missed different things, friends going off for a bachelor party or for, a, for whatever it might be. You miss those things because that's what it looks like, right? To sort of make your way in this business. And by living far away, I missed out on a lot of those life experiences as well. So part of it is you have to make sure that you're passionate about doing this because it comes with sacrifices. That's the simple truth. Um, and those exist still to this day. As many years as I've done it, I've still worked each of the last however many Christmases or New Year's that I can think of. In terms of balancing it now, it's a, it is a real challenge, right? Because when news breaks, I got to go. And so you need to have you need to have a partner in life who is in a position um, that they can support you. If you have kids, for example, you know, tomorrow I just got told you got to go to Atlanta for a shoot. So I said, hey, we're gonna. Are you home tomorrow? Like, otherwise, otherwise, I'm gonna have to move this, right? And so then that's when you start and you're roping in neighbors and babysitters and breaking news. You know, like the COVID has changed things because I can report from home a lot more than I used to. So in fairness, in spite of the awfulness of this pandemic, it's also made it a little bit easier in some ways for me. And one of the reasons I really fought to become a correspondent covering politics is that general event, I would be based in Washington. And I, having been doing it for a lot of years, was looking to create a family and have a little bit more of a life. For years, though, when I was working at the network, there would be news that would break and they would say, you got to go. And you would literally go, not like driving an hour away or 20 minutes away. You would be flying five hours away for a story about whatever it might be. So those were unique challenges that are especially unique to the network, obviously, right? 
But the truth is, in terms of the balance, it is a it is a challenge every day. Every day you've got to negotiate and deal. I've been fortunate to be at it long enough, and now I have bosses that can be understanding. And I'll say, hey, I will work all Saturday if you need me to. I cannot work tonight. My wife has to go to a to an appointment, and I got to be with my kids. Right? It's not always perfect, and it doesn't work for every family. But you know, at some point, you just try to carve your way. Mm-hmm. That's great. And, and I kind of want to jump in there. Um, you talk about having a partner that understands and your wife. I mean, full disclosure, um, your wife um, is a, uh, a local Washington, D.C. Um, media personality. She's a gem of a gem, Allison Starling. And she is uh, as professional as they come. But then you have two parents your your children your two children have two parents that are in the news business yeah. and one works for one network the other one works for another network and you guys are probably doing zooms together in the house and nbc here and abc there i mean just talk about that whole dynamic i mean there are partners but then when you have a partner that's in the same business in the same industry doing the same thing Boy, there's got to be some stories to tell. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so the truth is you want to talk about, as I said to Christy, about having a good partner, having a partner who understands this business, understands when I got to run out the door has made a very big difference because I can't imagine trying to explain this as it goes when there isn't time to stop to explain. So she has been, I've been so blessed for her, not just as my wife, but as like a partner as we try to raise a family together. So for Allison, she anchors the news from our house. Right. So our house has gotten smaller and smaller as, as you got like cameras up and stuff like this. I'm in like a, a corner of, you know, our our uh, our bedroom right now trying to have this conversation. This is like our this is like the hiding place I could get into right now. And she's anchored a few minutes. So she's like, you better tell Lou, Lou you can't go way past your time. Um, but but the truth is, like, we I have a studio and the, they, they set up NBC set up. This is unique stuff. I admit this is special stuff in the network. They set up a studio in the basement because when COVID happened, they didn't know if we were going to be able to go in. So they gave us some just like handy cam equipment, equipment like older equipment, not fancy equipment. Now they have beefed it up to a bigger studio because when I'm anchoring the Today Show, when I was exposed to someone with COVID, I couldn't I was forced to self quarantine for 10 days and I had to do it in my basement. And fortunately we had a setup there that I could still do the news. I was fine. I was healthy and we did it. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, there are crazy stories, but the best is when she's anchoring the four o'clock news in DC and I was anchoring Nicole Wallace's show on MSNBC. And literally if you flip channels, you see different rooms in the house. I was like, you better pray the Wi-Fi holds or we'll be in big trouble. The family is going to be looking for work real quick. Yeah. And it's funny that when my kids first saw me on TV, they'd be like, ooh, ooh, there's daddy. And now it's just like, yeah, that's just my dad. So, you know, you have your kids now just like, yeah, I mean, that's that's just my dad and my mom just just working. I mean, will they finish up so we, we can have some time with them? You know, they don't care. They don't even know about this stuff. No, they walked in the shot. Allison has a great shot of my daughter with a little bike helmet peering in to see if she was on the news or could go outside with her. Yeah. Great shot of a pink helmet right in the middle of the news. I'm like, oh, man, we got it. Yeah, like that Folgers commercial. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, exactly. Exactly. That's great stuff. Uh, Tyra, 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 you're up. You're up. Hi, Mr. Alexander. It's nice to meet you. How are you too? So my question is, what is one tip that you would give a new journalist on how to handle criticism from the public? Mm. Ooh, Tyra, that is good. <laughs> I saved her for last, buddy. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's good. So I got to grow some tough skin doing this. The thing, I, the thing that I would say, and I sort of alluded to this when we started, is that being a journalist is not about being popular. If you got into journalism to try to be a celebrity or to be on television, then you're missing the boat of being a journalist, right? Now, there are a lot of unique and exciting experiences and the exhilaration of being on the news and being able to send, when I started this business, VHS cassettes home to my parents from Lexington, Kentucky. That's a pretty special thing, right? But at the same time, your job is to get to the facts in much the same way when I was covering President Trump and a lot of Democrats would say, yeah, good, tough question. Now I'll be covering Joe Biden, President Biden, ask a question. You know, this is a tough question. The Democrats would say, wait, 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 I thought you were, wait, you can't, wait, that, that's not how it works. Your job is just to ask the tough questions no matter who's in front of you, right? And to get to the root of it. So what I would say to you, one is try not to listen to all the noise, have faith in yourself, trust your gut, and do the homework, right? That means read no when i'm on air and i'm doing an interview i want to know way more about that topic that i'm going to get to talk about in that conversation so if someone says something i can say wait a second 
I read that you actually said this five days ago, not what you're telling me right now. So what changed, right? And that's sort of the way that you can kind of, in COVID times and vaccination times, inoculate yourself from that criticism is just know that when you're speaking, you're speaking based on the facts and based on the experiences that you've had and what you've seen and witnessed. Great question, Tyra. So acknowledge that you're dropping Peter basically because somebody poured into you and you mentioned uh, some of your mentors and some of the people I know that I had in my life, I've had the, the Stuart Scotts and the James Browns and people that I really, really looked up to. Yeah. Uh, Jason Jackson's and, you know, the people, David Aldridge, there's so many people that imparted stuff into my style and the way I do things now. Uh, who are some of the people that inspired you and, and, and uh, our mentors? I know you mentioned Tom Brokaw. Any others out there that people, you know, of different generations and this generation would know as, yeah, that, you know, that's, that's pretty much the goat. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, for, for me, I think at the top of the list would be both of my parents. My parents were divorced. I had like all the different challenges that everybody has in life. But the one thing that they shared in particular was they believed in me, they supported me, and they backed me up when things weren't great, right? And, and I think the best lesson that they gave me in terms of mentorship and advice was just ask the worst anybody can do is say no. Right for that Fidel interview, that interview with Fidel Castro, I told you, if we didn't reach out, so no way we got that got that interview. We did. You could have said no. They said yeah. When I was trying to interview Yao Ming at the opening uh, ceremony of the Beijing Olympics, they said, hey, we'll include you in the opening ceremony for NBC. This is like a big prime time broadcast. If you can get an interview with Yao Ming, how is that ever going to happen? I was up all hours reaching out. Finally got a hold of his agent. And his manager, and they called me hours before the uh, before the Olympics started, and said, "Hey, we reached out, we spoke to Yao. He knows to look for you. He'll do the interview." And he easily could have said no, but by asking, I put myself in those positions to succeed. So that's in terms of advice from mentors, my parents being at the top of the list. And beyond that, I guess there's no specific name that I would identify. Really, what I try to do is be a consumer of news as well. There's some reporters. Steve Hartman's a storyteller on CBS. He's so good. Mm -hmm. um, Pete Williams, who covers the Justice Department for us, he has to cover complicated topics and synthesizes them into English for an audience, right? You only get to tell a person once. I get to talk to you for an hour on the news. I tell the story in two minutes or a minute and a half. You got to do that well because you lose your audience's attention or you just confuse them all together. Those are two people whose work and whose scripts I, uh, I pay attention to. But it, be voracious readers, read, be interested, care about this stuff because to do it well, you really have to commit yourself to it. You can't just show up to the job, so to speak. So we see you as a correspondent, White House, we talked about all that. But a fun thing that I've seen now and more, it's grown more, is um, the anchoring that you now do. When you do the, uh, the Today Show on Saturdays uh, with, with Kristen Welker uh, and Dylan Dreyer, I mean, the, 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 the breadth and depth of your experience now from just now covering and being at one spot to now being on the desk, um, you know, teaching all of the students, you, you, you got to be a multimedia journalist. You got to be able to do all things well. Um, to have that change of pace, to anchor on a certain day and then still do that, uh, how rewarding is that for you, not just to now just be in the field and be a reporter correspondent, but also get some anchoring as well? Well, anchoring is a lot of fun for a lot of reasons, right? You get to dress up nice and sit in front of the camera and, 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 and talk a while. Um, so that's always, so that's always kind of a unique privilege. Now the flip to it is to get to this position, to have this anchor opportunity. I worked my way through a lot of places. Yeah. Um, and like when I got to NBC, they first, they gave me some shots to go on MSNBC and I was sitting at the desk the day that the plane landed in the Hudson, the miracle on the Hudson. Mm -hmm. Someone got in my ear and just said to me very simply, they said, Hey, there's a plane in the Hudson go. You gotta be able to talk for a while when you have very little information. So there are unique challenges to that. In terms of in terms of anchoring, now what I like is I like not just politics. I like a breadth of news. I like being a part of a segment that's more person personality driven, not celebrity news per se, but storytelling, stories about people. It doesn't have to be the political story of the day. And um, and so that's one of the things I really sort of enjoy about this. And as as a, as an anchor, you get also get to elevate your voice in the system and your voice doesn't matter more, but you can say to the folks who are producing the show, Hey, I really think we should focus on this story tomorrow. Or why haven't we tell this person's story or this 
last example I'll give. For example, my sister has a disability where you, you lose your vision and hearing. She's going deaf and blind. It's an awful thing. She's a hot shot, so she's going to be just fine. But um, and she has family that loves her, so we're going to look after her. But there was a, during the Super Bowl. Remember that when they did the national anthem, there was an African American guy. He had these big old dreads, and he yes. did sign. He performed the sign for the national anthem, and he was so colorful and just. Yeah. It was like really kind of mesmerizing. I was like, that guy is really a cool character. No one's telling me who he is. Who is that guy? He's from Washington, D.C. Went to Gallaudet in D.C. And we told his story. And to be in, because I pitched it, as we say, and to be in a position where I can have an idea, see something that I think is colorful, compelling, um, and, and, and interesting, say it to the bosses at the Today Show on NBC, do the story and then know that four or five million people are going to see it a few days later is a very unique honor and a, and a privilege that I don't take like lightly. Well, this has been an honor and it has been a privilege. I, I definitely want to thank my, my, my students first for uh, coming on and asking some great questions. So uh, Gabriella, Gary, Emeka, Sean Vincent, uh, Rueda, Christy, um, Tyra, thank you so much for the time. Um, and I'm sure that it just added some context from young and old and not so much young and old, but more seasoned students, because that's the great thing about the community college environment, uh, Peters, that I have um, parents and high schoolers all in the same class together with all different perspectives. And that's what the real world is. Um, so the, and for you to kind of um, bring that home in the way that journalists tell stories, it just goes hand in hand. So I do want to thank the students. And but I really, really want to thank you for your time. I know that you're very, very busy. And I know personal relationships uh, mean a lot. And it means a lot to me that you uh, took some time to uh, impart your wisdom into these students. I get only thing I first of all thank you thanks to all those students those were great questions and they're important for people like me to hear those questions because sometimes you get so focused on your daily grind and you kind of miss the big picture of what you're trying to do in this job but what I would say to you guys is first of all I hope this was a conversation that you found enlightening or interesting or or a good distraction for an hour if nothing else but secondly we need journalists now more than ever we need people who care about this america needs it the world needs it we need people who care about sharing stories not just their own but the stories of the people around them so i encourage all of you if, if what lou teaches you and what i'm telling you today if it keeps resonating i hope you'll stick with it because this is a very exciting and and more than anything else really a valuable way to spend your life mm -hmm. thanks for your time sir appreciate it thank you all be safe take care thank you this Real Talk conversation is part of an ongoing speaker series presented by the Humanities Department to provide empowering opportunities for our students to gain insight and exposure from individuals actually working in the industry. And as you have just witnessed, that exposure was clearly captured. A special thanks to Mr. Alexander and to all the awesome production folks at both the Center for Performing Arts and PGCC TV who make sure events like this are captured and broadcast to you. To learn more about what's going on at Prince George's Community College, especially in the new Center for Performing Arts, please visit our website www.pgcc.edu forward slash arts. I'm Lou Holder. Have a blessed day, and thanks again for watching.